All right, so here we go, video number 11 in the series. When I was a kid, I used to look up at the night sky and wonder, are we the only ones? Y'all hear that? I wanted to know, is yeah. there some place out there Yes. Among oh, the billions of stars, my, uh, billions of galaxies, on and it's is there another that. planet as amazing as our Earth? I used to wonder if somewhere in all the vast space there Can was you a still place hear like it? this. Yes. With all the ingredients okay. to sustain life. Have you ever asked yourself, could there be more planets as special as this? Or is Earth? The only one. Just how unique is our planet? <clears throat> Hi, I'm Marcus Lloyd, and that's the subject we're going to tackle in this episode of Unlocking the Mysteries of Genesis. Last time, we talked about the Big Bang Theory. Secular scientists say the universe began from a single point in a massive explosion, a Big Bang, and spread outward. Creation scientists have pointed out flaws in this theory. For example, the Big Bang theorist expected that the cosmic background radiation released by that explosion would be nearly the same in all directions in space. But observations from space missions showed that the radiation was not perfectly uniform. Subtle, hot, and cold spots were found. Both sides agree that the universe holds many galaxies, with many suns, stars, and probably planets as well. Can our Earth be so special among them all? What does the evidence show? Let's see what we can find. This is our solar system, where Earth joins seven other planets in orbit around a giant sun. The ones closest to the sun are called terrestrial planets because they're composed mainly of rock and metal. Nearest to the sun is Mercury, then Venus, and of course Earth, the third planet out, and then Mars. The four outer planets are the gas giants, made primarily of gas and frozen vapor. These are Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And of course, poor Pluto which recently lost its planet status and is now classified as a dwarf planet. Earth orbits the sun, spinning on its axis, while the moon orbits in synchronous rotation, or tidal locking, meaning that the same side always faces us. Our solar system is part of a spiral galaxy called the Milky Way. It's been estimated that there are between 100 and 400 billion stars in this galaxy alone. We're around 27,000 light years from the center. On one arm of a spiral, a huge collection of gas and dust called Orion Cygnus. The scientist, Carl Sagan, once asked, who are we? We find that we live on an insignificant planet of a humdrum star lost in a galaxy tucked away in some forgotten corner of a universe in which there are far more galaxies than people. Billions and billions of suns, stars, planets makes you feel rather insignificant. And it all began, the secular scientists say, with a bang. The Big Bang Theory assumes that there are no special places in the universe, that everything around us is the result of a cosmic accident with no planning and no purpose. So if life evolved here and the conditions are not special, then surely life can evolve elsewhere, right? 
Secular scientists say that life ought to be very common in the universe because they argue, well, if life evolved here, it must have evolved somewhere else. The real issue is, do the laws of physics and chemistry in our universe permit spontaneous generation? Do they permit life to come from non-life? And all of our observations, all of our scientific observations are indicating that the answer is no. Using the information from the Hubble Space Telescope, secular scientists estimate that one out of every 200 stars that we can see may have a planet with the necessary conditions for life. These planets orbit in what we call the Goldilocks zone, like Earth. This is the area not so close to the sun that the oceans boil away and not so far that the oceans freeze. Scientists believe that liquid oceans are critical because water is the universal solvent, holding the organic materials for life, like DNA. Now, if the secular estimates are correct, that would mean 500 million planets in just our own galaxy would have life. NASA's space telescopes have found what their scientists believe is a planet in this habitable zone, the Goldilocks zone. It's called Kepler 22b. And it's about 2.4 times the radius of Earth. No one knows yet what the conditions are like, or even if it's predominantly rocky, gaseous, or liquid in composition. Well, the Kepler mission is basically an attempt to find what they call exoplanets, uh, particularly those that would be Earth-like and that would be uh, at the right distance from their, their stars in order to have liquid water. To study these extrasolar planets, scientists have created a spacecraft, the Kepler spacecraft, and what it does is it systematically examines millions of stars and watches for very small changes in their brightness. And the idea behind that is when a planet crosses in front of its star, from our point of view, it blocks some of the star's light just a little bit and causes the star's brightness to drop ever so slightly. Now, the Kepler spacecraft can measure that small brightness and determine that there is an orbiting planet around the star. And of course, there are other things that will cause a star to change brightness, some of them pulsate and so on, and so you have to deal with these other variables. But the Kepler mission is a really fantastic mission, and I find that it confirms that God really is very creative in the things that he's made in this universe. Uh, they might find a planet that has, it's in the right sort of zone for uh, liquid water. The Kepler 22b, for example, that particular planet that's been discovered, they think it's roughly in that habitable zone. Uh, my secular colleagues are very excited about finding evidence of water in space, especially liquid water. They very much want to find liquid water because you need liquid water for life. And basically, they have this idea that finding water is almost the next best thing to finding life. But really, that's fallacious because even though life needs liquid water, liquid water by itself is not enough to have life. Now, actually, water is a pretty common molecule in the universe, so it really wouldn't surprise me at all if there is water uh, out in space somewhere, because we find the molecules. It's just a question, do you find it in a liquid state? But it wouldn't surprise me at all if we found that at some point. There is evidence that Mars once had liquid water on its surface. We find dried riverbeds, for example, even deltas. And so that suggests that there has been liquid water on that planet. But you see, my secular colleagues believe that wherever you find uh, water, there's a good chance that life will evolve. And that's where I differ with my secular colleagues, because I believe that God created life on this world, and we've not seen any good evidence to the contrary. It's important to recognize that the Earth is unique. Our sun is a very stable star. It's in a class that represents only about 5% of all stars. Many stars in this group pulsate radically and give off deadly flares, but not our sun. Long-term studies carried out at places like the McMath Solar Observatory show that it is remarkably stable. And we know that the sun goes through an 11-year activity cycle, but the highs and lows of the cycle are mild and don't have any negative impact on life here on Earth. Our sun is perfectly designed for us. The sun is a main sequence star, which about 90% of stars are. And basically that means they obey a particular rule that if, they, if you know the mass of the star, you know everything about it. Its color, its temperature, its brightness, and so on. The sun obeys that rule. But even among main sequence stars, the sun is unusually stable. And it has uh, uh, very mild flares. It has the right amount of uh, radiation to heat the Earth and so on, but not so much to destroy life on Earth. It really is a very specially designed star 
and it has some unusual uh, features as a result of that. Well, the secular scientists are very fond of saying that the sun is just a run-of-the-mill average star, but it's really not. Uh, there are lots of stars out there that we think are very violent, uh, that eject what we call super flares, that if, if something like that were to happen here on Earth, it would be devastating to life on Earth. So it's very stable. Uh, the energy output of the sun doesn't change a whole lot. Uh, there's something called the total solar irradiance, or TSI, and it usually changes less than one-tenth of a percent per an 11-year solar cycle. But really, the sun is very uniquely designed for life on Earth. Many stars pulsate, some of them magnificently. Some of them will be very bright one year and then have this very slow pulsation, very faint the next. You could imagine that wouldn't do so well for life on Earth if the sun did that. If the sun were suddenly 300% brighter for a couple of years, well, that would obliterate life on Earth. Or if it, it shrank down and, you know, the oceans froze over, that would be a problem as well. The sun is unusually stable for a star. It has only very minor pulsations, enough pulsations that we can actually probe into depth into the sun below its surface to see what it's made of, but not pulsations that are so severe that it would disrupt life on Earth. Why is everything here so well suited to life? We live in an oasis in space, orbiting our sun in that, that Goldilocks zone. Earth is the perfect spot for life. It's the only one of the bodies in our solar system capable of sustaining life. Mercury is closest to the sun and has no atmosphere. That, plus the extremely high temperatures on the sun-facing side, make it inhospitable to life. Venus is about the same size as Earth, but it has a dense, hot atmosphere that's mostly carbon dioxide. You won't find life there. Now, Mars has always seemed a likely candidate. A day there is about as long as here, but it's smaller than Earth, and the atmosphere is too thin to sustain life. The air on Mars has only about one one-thousandth as much water as our air. Jupiter is just a big ball of gas, and you're not gonna wanna live there. We found no evidence of life on any of its moons. Saturn is also a cold ball of gas, and its moons appear to be barren, lifeless places. Uranus and Neptune are gas giants too, and Pluto is just ice. None of these are going to have life, but Earth is uniquely suited for it. Our planet is big, 8,000 miles in diameter. It weighs around 6.6 .6 sextillion tons. We have giant oceans with thousands of islands and great land masses covered with streams, rivers, mountains, deserts, ice caps. Every place on this planet has some form of life. Our planet journeys around the sun at an average distance of 93 million miles. Our orbit is fairly circular, so that distance never changes at any significant way. We're at just the right spot for water to exist in the liquid state. Now, if Earth's orbit were as extreme as many of the planets that we've seen outside our solar system, then oceans would boil at the closest point and freeze at the furthest. Liquid water is essential to life here on Earth. Without our oceans and our unique atmosphere, life would be impossible here. The Earth's atmosphere is just right. It has just the right amount of thickness for life to exist on this planet. It protects the Earth from cosmic radiation. It, it protects the Earth from, to some extent, from ultraviolet radiation due to a protective layer of ozone and oxygen that block ultraviolet radiation. Uh, UV light is very damaging to living cells, and so it's important that we have those, that kind of atmosphere, an atmosphere of free oxygen so that we can breathe, there's no other known planet that has that. Uh, the Earth also has a protective magnetic field, which uh, basically deflects cosmic radiation, at least charged cosmic radiation. It helps protect us from these energetic charged particles that come from space. Basically, uh, they slam into the atmosphere and the atmosphere takes the hit for us. In fact, the Earth's magnetic field will tend to channel a lot of those particles toward the polar regions and when those energetic particles collide with these, uh, these, up, these atoms in the upper atmosphere, you get visible light being produced, which is why we have the beautiful aurora or the northern and southern lights. But those atoms up in the atmosphere, they take the hit 
and they absorb a lot of that, th those dangerous high energy charged particles that are coming from space. You see, charged particles cannot pass directly through a magnetic field. They get distorted by that, they get moved by it. Now, if the Earth's magnetic field, if the Earth didn't have one, that would be a bit problematic for life. And that's a, something that we'll have to consider if humans ever want to visit Mars, for example, because Mars does not have that protective magnetic field like the Earth does. On the other hand, if the magnetic field were very strong like Jupiter's, that would kill living organisms because it would just, it would irradiate them because of the strength of that magnetic field. In fact, if the magnetic field were too strong, it would actually prevent atoms from even uh, being formed in the first place. And so we have a magnetic field that's just right for life on Earth. Light energy from the sun warms the Earth's surface, which in turn warms the air close to the surface. This less dense air rises and creates wind currents. These carry carbon dioxide from areas that produce it to areas that need it. Our atmosphere is a natural thermostat to maintain thermal equilibrium suitable for life. It offers some protection from space debris as well. Without our atmosphere, Earth's surface would look a lot like the surface of the moon. The moon's size and position is also perfect. If it were larger or nearer Earth, huge tides would overflow Earth's lowlands and erode mountain ranges. If the moon were farther, tides would be weaker and the oceans could stagnate. Earth's tilt at 23 degrees on its axis is also well suited for life. If it were tilted less, the habitable regions would be reduced. And if the tilt were greater, seasons would become too extreme. Only God could have put all these protections in place at one time. There's just no hard evidence that any of the other planets are capable of sustaining life. It's wishful thinking on the part of the secular scientist. They assume that if life evolved here, then it surely would have evolved elsewhere in the universe too. But as we saw in an earlier episode, life didn't evolve here. It was created. So there's no reason to think it could have evolved anywhere else. What does the Bible have to say about all this? We find when, when the Bible teaches on a particular topic, it's right, and astronomy is no exception. When the Bible, for example, teaches about the nature of the earth, it tells us that the earth is round or, or spherical, and that's exactly right. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22, it talks about the circle of the earth, and that would have been hard to believe, perhaps, at the time that it was written when most people did believe in a flat earth. Or in uh, Job, for example, when God describes the earth as uh, being suspended in space, hanging the earth upon nothing, the Bible says. And it also describes it as God inscribing a circle on the face of the waters at the boundary between light and darkness. Now that only makes sense on a spherical world because indeed the, the, the light stops or terminates uh, where um, the earth's shadow is and that's always a circle because the earth is a spherical world. So the Bible's exactly right when it talks about the nature of the earth. And one of the things the Bible teaches is that God formed the earth to be inhabited, Isaiah chapter 45, verse 18. For thus says the Lord, who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. Genesis describes the order of creation. Earth was created on the first day and filled with vegetation on the third day. The sun, moon, and stars were created specifically for the earth as lights. Each was created individually for its own function. Genesis 1.16 says, On the fourth day, God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. The stars are much simpler structures than earth, composed mostly of hydrogen and helium. Earth is three days older than any other planet. And that's just one of the unique things about it. Secular scientists believe everything arose from random processes and primeval chaos, a big bang. But the Bible clearly says that the earth was designed for man. And the evidence shows this. Wherever we look, we see evidence of balance, of a world designed for life. And as far as we know, no other planet has life. Earth is totally unique. God emphasized the uniqueness of Earth because he spent five days working on it and only one day for everything else. But then you ask yourself, how does this affect my life? God has prepared the Earth in a way that we can depend on it. You can count on its stability. Stability is evidence of God's promise. 
It's all here in Genesis. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. God saw that it was good. And later God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. What did Carl Sagan say? We find that we live on an insignificant planet of a humdrum star lost in a galaxy tucked away in some forgotten corner of a universe in which there are far more galaxies than people. If that's true, what does that say about our individuality, our relationships, our purpose in life, our reason for being? Are we really so insignificant? Do you think our planet is unimportant? Is creation so humdrum? As we've seen time and time again, the amazing beauty and the complexity of life on Earth, this world and the universe proclaims the glory of God. Next time, we'll take a look back at all the scientific evidence we've uncovered, and we'll delve into scripture to understand why what we believe about the origins of life matters. Until then, I'm Marcus Lloyd. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Unlocking the Mysteries of Genesis. Any initial thoughts, comments on that? Sagan's just a big party pooper. <laughs> I actually sort of love the little nod right after the Sagan quote where he then used billions and billions in the next sentence of the narration of this. So um, how many of you actually ever saw the, the original version? You know, they redid one here with uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson from <coughs> four or five years ago. How many, how many of you ever saw any parts of the original Cosmos from the... That late seventies, early eighties. I'm trying to place when it was. We didn't see it. Actually, my um, in high school, my physics teacher. We actually watched it in physics. We watched the whole thing. It was one of the things that the you know the district had on. You know the big umatic tapes, you know, for those of you that actually know what that is, you know, the big VCR tapes. Um, but, you know, one of the things I remember about that was, you know, it was, it was, there was a whole sequence on evolution. And of course there was, um, you know, the famous things which sort of became catchphrases and even the ways that people would make fun of saying later star stuff, you know, we're made of star stuff and the billions and billions and things like that. Um, but, you know, that was my first exposure in a big way to what I would just call uh, the secular science um, um, propaganda is a word that comes in my head. I'll just call it the secular science narrative. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, so, you know, that's the reason Sagan gets quoted so often is that, you know, that was big thing actually got good ratings for it being on PBS. And again, you know, centered around some interesting things, but it's interesting how much of that, because I rewatched parts of it about a year ago, actually how much of that has now been, uh, disproven slash, you know, re refuted by further additional science, you know, uh, the things that were, have been discovered since refuted some of the things that he stated there as if they were just absolute, you know, this is fact. And so I, I find that interesting and curious. Uh, the thing that kept jumping into my head, and I'm going to ask you guys to comment on this, thing, is that, gee, our son is boring, right? <laughs> I mean, that was sort of the, the whole premise there is there's nothing, nothing unusual about our sun or our planet. Did you sort of get that theme? Yeah. And the interesting thing to me was how that was turned back around to say that's exactly what makes it amazing is that it's all those things that make it 
average beyond average and non-exciting beyond non-exciting are the thing that allows, that's what makes it unique. Did you pick up on that theme? Yeah. So what do you think about that? Another reason why it just wasn't by chance. Everything yep. had to be perfectly in place for this to be. What's the hottest temperature that any of you have ever actually been in that you were there that you that you endured? ASR said 125 degrees. Okay. <clears throat> I can remember being in Dallas in the early 80s, and it was supposedly 115. Um, and what's the coldest temperature that any of you have ever endured? Negative 20. Negative 20. Where was that at, Sherry? Alaska. Alaska. I said negative 27. Okay. And was there any wind with that, or was that just the air temp? Yeah. Yeah. So we're talking about a range there of 150 degrees Fahrenheit, which is a lot. Uh, if you went directly from 125 to 27 below instantly, you would um, yeah. you'd, you'd notice that change, right? Uh, but when you hear you know some of the temperature fluctuations, like on the moon or on you know Mars or things like that, the temperature range spread is. Uh, hundreds and in some cases even almost approaching thousands of degrees difference if you're talking about you know something that's close to the sun like Venus so even our most extreme backs and forths are in this very narrow range which is the point that he was trying to make there so I'm, I'm just going to throw it out here does anybody have any thoughts on whether there is life elsewhere that there's planets that support life Well, I, I just don't tend to think so because of the uniqueness of the earth and the sun and where we live, okay. that God created it to be inhabited by the people that he created. Again, that element of design that Sherry was mentioning there, it, there there's intent, there's extreme intent in what's, what, what, what we have here. If we were to discover there's life <laughs> elsewhere, even in quote unquote intelligent life elsewhere, do you think that that would invalidate or would that challenge our beliefs at all? No. Why not? Well, because God's, God's the creator and he can do what he wants. And if right. he did create life elsewhere, it's just more of his creation. Anybody else have a different thought on that? Or the same thought, maybe a different way? That's the way I feel. Now, I remember having a discussion once with somebody in college about, you know, with the, <laughs> the, proof of the, the proof of the existence of extraterrestrial life would be like, you know, the biggest blow to organized religion and belief in God. And I said, it you know, wouldn't phase me one little bit uh, because... I believe in a God who's infinite and powerful enough that he can do whatever. And if that's his choice, that's his choice. But, but I do, I do agree with what we saw here in the, the series. And the more and more I understand this, this idea of, you know, the structure of everything around life, the structure of around, you know, creation, how science works are all these very delicate, precisely tuned balances that if you alter, as they pointed out in the video just now, anything either way a little bit, it radically changes the, um, the ability to do it. And there's all these subtle things that we didn't even realize until modern science that protect us when he was talking about the magnetic fields and the effect of radiation and things like that. You know, those were things that we really only came to understand as we moved into the space travel age. That's been less than, what, I guess now we're you know, 60 plus years, 60 to 65 years now. And, uh, you know, we didn't realize that until we 
began to explore space and discovered, oh, that's pretty important uh, that we have that in place. So, so Don, isn't it kind of, I mean, what, I mean, why couldn't God create life that's not carbon based? Well, he could create life that's, you know, based on something else, you know? That's correct. <clears throat> yeah, it, 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 it's, it's interesting to me, I, you know, when you mentioned that, Sherry, the first thing that popped in my head is science make, sci, the scientists, you know, the, for example, the big thing is, as he mentioned, you know, let's find water, right? Because we need water yeah. for life, right? Which, which we get here. But again, that's, there's this idea of scientists saying, you know, this, the universe is vast and diverse and all of this, but then they keep looking for the exact same special unique conditions that are here. Yeah. As if that's the only way that it could work or the only way that it could be. That just and, shows again, they don't know our God. They don't right. understand him you know, because he, I think it's just air. I mean, it's just, I think it's, it's humans that we think that's just so arrogant to just limit him, you know, who are we to limit him, you know? Yeah. Well, and then, and then, and who are we to assume that we understand, you know, the fact that God has chosen to seek a personal relationship with us and gone to the lengths that he has to do it obviously indicates that's valuable to him. But, you know, it's, it's this, yeah, one thing I think we've talked about this before is one of the things I think that's become dangerous in our last, in our, in our current generation is this lack of understanding, or I'll just call it, you know, well, the biblical term for it is fear, but it's awe, you know, just being in awe of God, because, you know, we, he is a God that relates to us personally because of our relationship, but he's still God. That's right. <laughs> and uh, if we can't fully grasp, you know, the bottom, the bottom line is we can't fully grasp what that means to you know, his power, his wisdom. Again, it's his ways are not our ways, as the Bible says. And what we tend to want to, it's real easy in our heads to try to understand God to limit God, if that makes any sense, because that's the only way we can try to understand him is by putting him inside of finite limits and he's infinite. Right. And so that's not, that's not an ad, uh, an accurate representation of God. That's our way of grasping who God is. So um, I totally get that. I'm going to go ahead and get us rolling into the last video here. I, I, as you mentioned, it's going to be more of a summary type thing, and that'll leave us a couple of minutes after the fact to be able to discuss it. I'm going to go ahead and get that rolling now, which means I've got to go back to sharing my screen and make sure the audio stuff is still all what it needs to be. And it is, so we should be good to go. Let me know when you guys can hear this. Since the dawn of history, man has struggled to answer questions like, where do we come from? How did life begin? Is there a God? Why are we here? For centuries, Christians found answers in the Bible without question. Theologians were often scientists, and scientists were often theologians. There was little or no perceived conflict between science and scripture. But today, there seems to be a struggle between the two. Christians still find answers in the Bible, the Word of God. But many Christians question if the Bible is completely true. Can we rely on the Bible as an accurate record of creation? Can't we just believe some of it? I'm Marcus Lloyd, and this is Unlocking the Mysteries of Genesis. Now, since at least the beginning of recorded history, man has sought to explain the world around him. Their rational brains seek to explain the reason for their beliefs. It hasn't always been easy. War, disease, famine, slavery, brutality, injustice, death, lots of death, 
have some asking the question why God would allow such things to happen. Now, many people have turned to the Bible for answers. Others have disputed the existence of God and looked for answers in only science and philosophy. And yet there are some that believe that life's biggest questions can be found in the places where science and faith meet. Those are the places that we've explored in unlocking the mysteries of Genesis. Now, throughout the series, we have acknowledged and explained the evolutionary perspective on creation as fairly as we can. We do think there are some flaws. So this time, we're gonna look back at those questions from a creation science perspective. We've detailed strong evidence that confirms the accounts of creation as described in Genesis, and we'll see why this issue of time is so important to you and me. We began this journey with a basic question. Was the world designed by God or did it just happen? Secular science attributes all of creation to a lucky break, a random chance, a cosmic accident that resulted in life forming on Earth. It's a rather bleak perspective on life and death. We're born, we die. Our brief time alive on this planet comes and goes without purpose. It's just a natural cycle of life and death. But when Christians look at the complexity and beauty of the world, we see a world that is designed, a world with order, reason, purpose, and meaning, a view of creation that means we also have order, reason, purpose, and meaning. Remember the hummingbird and the mimic octopus that can disguise itself to look like many other creatures? Those aren't random. Even the simplest of cells is complex and shows design. And to be designed, they need a designer. In our view, this is the real story of how life began, according to Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God established the grass and herbs and trees, and he created the lights and the firmaments of the heavens to divide the day from the night and for seasons and for days and years. God created the creatures of the sea and the birds of the earth, and he created the land animals, each according to its kind. And last, he created man in his own image and likeness. And then God saw everything he had made, and indeed, it was very good. That, simply put, is how everything began. Genesis explains it all right there, all of creation. The planet, the solar system, our atmosphere, ourselves, not creation of the universe by a Big Bang and not the creation of life by a random chemical accident and a primordial soup. So to an atheist, evolution is the God, the substitute God for how everything came about. They personify natural selection, they personify natural forces, and these for them are the thing to be worshiped. It's someone who's cruel, who's clumsy, who doesn't know what he's doing. He tries, it doesn't work, he tries again. He's not the omnipotent, all-powerful, sovereign God that we see in Genesis 1. You really have to worship someone different if you hold evolution and be consistent. The evolutionary model, in fact, relies on time and death, long ages of time and lots and lots of death. That is quite a different perspective than believing that God created life or that God created man in his own image. Life on earth can be cruel, but Christians have a different view of difficulties on earth. Death, disease, horrible mutations, those things we perceive as the cruelty of nature are not because God is cruel. While we don't know why God allows some things to happen, we do know that he offers grace to handle the difficulties in life. And we know that originally, death started in the garden. When Adam and Eve introduced sin, into a perfect world. So the Bible has an explanation for both the beauty and design and the cruelty of death. And the evidence points to divine creation and to the uniqueness of man. Let's revisit one of the myths that gets a lot of attention from the secular world. The myth that humans and chimpanzees share a common ancestor. There are things about us that chimpanzees, that animals don't do. And that's not in our, our DNA, that's because we're made in the image of God. 
I was thinking about writing a book called Chimpanzees Don't Build Jets, because sometimes in these complex discussions we miss the forest for the trees. No chimpanzee, no group of chimpanzees on this planet have ever put their minds together and built something close to what humans build. We put men on the moon, and there's no species on the planet that's done that. So mankind is utterly unique and separate from chimpanzees, separate from the rest of the animal and plant world. Both male and female were directly created in the image of God and have a unique ability to have a personal relationship with the one who gave them his own likeness. A few episodes back, we talked about the age of the Earth. Most secular scientists are convinced that the Earth is billions of years old, that life slowly and gradually evolved from simple to complex creatures, and that people have existed on Earth for just a tiny fraction of that time. They point to fossils in the geological layers as evidence for evolution, but of course, the missing fossils, the ones belonging to the theoretical transitional forms that don't exist, are a problem for the evolutionary model. But despite the fact that the evolutionary model is cited as fact in most textbooks, the evidence for long Earth ages and evolution does not stand up to scrutiny. The fossil record shows creatures fully formed, each according to their kind. Just as Genesis says, creation scientists have studied the same geological evidence, the same fossils, and used the very same testing methods as secular scientists, and they've arrived at a very different timeline and a very different explanation for what they see in the geological strata and the fossil record, Noah's Flood. For a creation scientist, the story of Noah's flood is much more than the account of a flood. It's the most important geological event ever to happen on the face of the Earth since the creation, and its significance is profound. It caused a wholesale makeover of Earth's geography and climate, and we can see this in the geological evidence. One reason Noah's flood is so important to creation scientists is that it marked the end of the pre-flood world, the first age of Earth history, and the beginning of the second age, the one we're in now, that will end at the Day of Judgment. After destruction of the pre-flood Earth, God promised by the Rainbow Covenant He would never again destroy the Earth with a worldwide flood. It would take another few hundred years for the Earth to settle down from the lasting effects of Noah's flood, the remnants of which we can still see today. The dinosaurs were destroyed during the flood, along with every other living creature except the two of each kind on Noah's Ark. And what about the small, young dinosaurs that were sheltered on the Ark? Like Noah's family and all other animal kinds, they began a new population. Now, some of the very same dinosaur fossils that the evolutionists claim are millions of years old have revealed some astonishing evidence that completely undermines the secular timeline. Original soft tissue and blood cells have been found in dinosaur bones. How can that be the case if these fossils are millions of years old? Evolutionists simply do not have good answers to these questions, but creation scientists are not surprised. This evidence is perfectly consistent with the biblical account. Additional evidence from anthropology suggests that dinosaurs and mankind lived at the same time fairly recently. There are written eyewitness accounts from known historical figures like Herodotus and Marco Polo. There are also numerous artistic representations of dinosaurs and cave paintings and carvings from prehistoric civilizations. Dragons and other dinosaur-like creatures are still pervasive in world folklore, including countless stories from the medieval age of heroic knights slaying dragons until all the dragons, or dinosaurs, were extinct. All of these sources supply information that agrees with the biblical record of Leviathan and Behemoth, which are described by God Himself in His conversations with Job. But why is it important whether dinosaurs lived and died before humans, or whether they lived with humans? The Bible makes it very clear that uh, death came into the world as a result of Adam's sin. Now, if you believe fossils are hundreds of millions of years old, then that can't be because a fossil's a dead thing, and we all agree human beings don't go back hundreds of millions of years. So was death already in the world when Adam sinned? 
If it was, then death isn't really the penalty for sin. And if death isn't the penalty for sin, then why did Jesus Christ have to die on the cross? And so the heart of Christianity really goes back to God creating in six days and resting one, That's and death being the penalty for sin. Here's another thing that an omnipotent designer planned. After the flood, humanity had to rebuild the population from Noah and his sons. We've also explored evidence that confirms that at a modest growth rate, the world population can get to today's size and genetic diversity in just 4,500 years. Archaeological discoveries and historical writings also verify many of the people and places in the Bible, like the Tower of Babel and its wicked leader Nimrod. There is strong evidence that the 70 original major language groups stem from when God confused language at the Tower of Babel. The historical evidence confirms what the Bible says in Acts 17, 26. He has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Again, we see how God used his powers to fulfill his mandate and shape the world into what it is today. In just the past few years, we've been able to look at the universe in ways that astronomers of the past could only dream of. The enormity and magnificence of our universe staggers the imagination. Yet the more we see and learn, the more we stand in awe of the variety of stars and galaxies and the order and precision they display. 1 Corinthians 15, uh, among other passages in the Bible, tells us that the heavens, well, declare God's glory. It tells us one star differs from another in glory, and that parallels what we read in Psalm 19, that the heavens declare the glory of God. And we certainly see that when we look into space. We see the beauty, we see the power, we see the majesty of God's hand revealed in what he has created. One of the most controversial topics in the debate between evolution and creation is how the universe began. The secular assumption, which is the most popular, is that the universe was created when a small dot of energy exploded some 13 billion years ago. Of course, no one was there to witness it, and no one has ever seen a star form, and no one can explain how even a hypothetical Big Bang could have possibly occurred without a supernatural force. No known laws in the universe can make something out of nothing, so God the Creator is the only explanation. Genesis 1.16 confirms this. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. If God is the only explanation for the universe, then we can trust that he created everything else as described in Genesis, including Earth, a special, unique home for man whom God made in his own image. You know, my secular colleagues believe that this planet is just one among billions and it's, it's, there's nothing special about the Earth, just a pale blue dot, as uh, Carl Sagan put it. Uh, but when we look into the universe, we see all kinds of planets out there, but none of them that are as unique as Earth. God spent five of the six days of creation week working the Earth, making it right for life. So the Bible is clear. We, you and I, God made us in his image to be caretakers of the Earth. How airtight is the argument for an ancient Earth? Not very. Yet, it is assumed to be the only real scientific theory. To think otherwise often subjects doubters to ridicule and abuse. But history has proved correct many scientists like Galileo who believed in creation and dared to question the prevailing theories of their day. The age of the Earth is a central question in the evolution-creation debate and a topic that fuels passion on both sides. Why does it matter if the earth is billions of years old or a few thousand, as the Bible says? Does it really make that much of a difference to us here and now? Yeah, some people have tried to get around the time scale of creation by saying, well, who knows what a day means to God? I mean, after all, doesn't the Bible tell us one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is one day? So how, when, when God's speaking about time, what does that mean? Well, in fact, God is beyond time. He created time. 
Therefore, when God uses time terminology, it is always for our benefit and therefore always to be understood on human terms. And so when God tells us that he made in six days and rested one, we're to take that as God making in six days and rested one. Additional evidence that God made in six days comes from the way it's worded in Genesis. The Hebrew word for day is yom, and it can perhaps in certain poetic contexts, like in the day of the Lord, it can mean a longer period of time than 24 hours, but not in the context of Genesis 1. In fact, God defines the word day. He says, and God called the light day, so day is when it's light out. He's defining his terms there. And then it goes on and says the evening and the morning were the first day. And of course, he's defining it in terms of Earth's rotation, therefore, one evening plus one morning is a day. You know, some people have said, well, why does it really matter why we believe in six days or, or millions of years? Who cares? If the Bible is wrong about the time scale of creation, then how can we trust it on other matters? If God can't even get the details right in Genesis, how can we trust that he got the details right on how to inherit eternal life? So it really does matter. Jesus told John in John 3, 12, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? It's a fundamental question. Two of Christ's apostles provide keys in the importance of the evidence that is readily available to anyone who seeks a relationship with the omnipotent and omniscient creator. In Romans 1.20, Paul noted that God's invisible attributes, his eternal power and Godhead are clearly seen by the things that are made. As we've seen throughout this series, much of the evidence for God as creator is readily available. Anyone can bear witness to God's glory by simply looking up at the stars. Yet few take the time to seek answers, and many voices are silenced and drowned out by the scoffers. Peter warned us that scoffers willfully forget the evidence that directly is in front of them. The uniformitarian or naturalistic view, remember, claims that the slow, gradual processes we see today are sufficient to explain both our existence as well as rocks and fossils. As Peter warned us, the scoffers will say, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. But we've seen plenty of evidence that Earth's geological processes do change rates. The evidence has forced secular geologists to acknowledge that geological features can form very rapidly, although they still try to hold on to their belief in millions of years. Evolution, the Big Bang model, and other secular origin theories come from a naturalistic worldview that has become dominant in just the last 200 years or so. The naturalistic worldview exalts nature and man and attempts to explain the existence and nature of everything without God. The moral and societal implications of that are enormous. The economic and social theorist Jeremy Rifkin explained it this way. We no longer feel ourselves to be guests in someone else's home and therefore obliged to make our behavior conform with a set of pre-existing cosmic rules. It's our creation now. We make the rules. We establish the parameters of reality. We create the world. And because we do, we no longer feel beholden to outside forces. We no longer have to justify our behavior for we are now the architects of the universe. We are responsible to nothing outside ourselves, for we are the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. According to that worldview, no higher plan, no higher purpose, no creator God. Anything goes. This series, Unlocking the Mysteries of Genesis, presents evidence that confirms a creationist worldview. This view stands in sharp contrast to the naturalistic worldview which dominates our educational and cultural institutions. The differences between a creationist and a naturalistic worldview are profound. In a Christian manifesto, the well-known 20th century philosopher, Dr. Francis Schaeffer observed, these two worldviews stand as totals in complete antithesis in content and also in their natural results. It is not just that they happen to bring forth different results, but it is absolutely inevitable that they will bring forth different results. So which worldview do you want to believe? Which one is true? 
The one in which mortal death is the end and your life is without purpose? Or the one that believes in God the Creator? The one in which mankind has a higher purpose? The one in which the law and the spirit of life in Christ Jesus makes you free from the law of sin and death? The one in which the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord? We've opened some doors for you and unlocked some of the mysteries of Genesis. Now it's up to you to weigh the evidence for yourself as honestly and as objectively as you can and decide. Which future do you want for yourself? was a pretty good summary too yeah so we don't have a lot of time here so we'll probably circle back around next week just to put a pin in this and that will actually work pretty well because that'll be the next week is not easter is two sundays from today correct uh, i have my head straight i think so i think it's the yeah so yeah. that'll that'll let us finish this up, put a nice little tidy bow on it next week, and then uh, I don't I don't think we'll be meeting on Easter Sunday. So um, do you know what we'll be doing next, Don? No, um, I guess I get to work on figuring that out this afternoon. I should have some time to do that. So uh, we'll circle back around to this. I want to sort of put you know put a bow on this next week and sort of bring everything together and talk about how we can you know, put it into application. Knowledge is great, but how we can best put it into application. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording.